Welcome back to the channel everyone. My name is Joe Buskins. This is our family's boat shop and I've got some two-part A and B pour foam in my hands. These are some sample batches that I have poured up today. And If you haven't guessed, today's episode is going to be all about A and B pour foam. Now we've got a table full of stuff already set up. Here we've got some test batches ready to pour and we got some cool tests today. We are actually going to try to simulate like what and how we would do if we were pouring floor foam under the floor of a boat. And to mimic that, what we're doing today is I just got some little clear containers. I drilled some vent holes in one and we're gonna do one without vent holes. And I am gonna slightly overfill these uh, test boxes there so that you folks at home can see how we would apply foam if we were building a boat and what happens if you put too much foam. And I'm gonna be talking about tips and techniques all throughout. So a lot of people may have a lot of controversy on flotation foam and A and B foam underneath the floor of the boats. So there's a lot of folks that have had bad experiences with it soaking water. Modern foams are better than older foams. They tend to soak less water, but even if they're fully exposed and saturated, over time they will absorb a percentage but there are ways to kind of work around that so that you minimize the exposure. So what we're gonna do, we're just gonna start off uh, by mixing a couple of batches together and I'm gonna pour them in the first one with the vent holes to simulate what we would do if we were putting foam underneath a floor. Now, a lot of folks are like, well, if there's a problem with water absorption, why do you even put foam underneath the floor of a boat in the first place. Why would a manufacturer do that? It's actually required by law. The Coast Guard requires foam flotation on, on all boats under 21 feet. So we are required as boat builders to put it in those smaller boats. And a lot of smaller boats, like for example, Boston Whalers are known for their foam injected hulls that are unsinkable and they rely on that foam internally to add strength as well as buoyancy to their craft. So there's some advantages there, but there's also some disadvantages if you install it improperly. Now, when you're dealing with foam, you're gonna to wanna to wear a mask and gloves always. We always talk about PPE, and we've got an A and a B part, and to save time, I went ahead and poured up 10 ounces and 10 ounces, respectively, of the A and B pour foam. Now, I did some testing this morning. I've got a 26.33 expansion rate on my foam today on my test batch generally somewhere between 25 and 30 to 1 is what you can kind of expect and all i did to kind of figure out how much foam i need is i calculated the ounces and volume of our test boxes about 13 quarts and runs it around about 420 ounces and divided the 26.33 into the 420. And it gives me, it was around 16 and a half ounces, but I'm gonna round up to 20, so we got a little bit extra there. I hope that made sense for everybody. So we are gonna be using a drill to mix this. Wanna be wearing some eye protection and some respiratory protection as well. I hope you folks can hear me just fine. So we're going with our A or a B first rather now you can mix this with just a little paddle or a stick but a drill is going to do a better it's going to do a better job for sure you need about 30 seconds about 30 seconds of mix time here we go with our a there we go and we did source this from our friends there at fiberglass warehouse you guys have seen me use their products before mostly gel coat and their vinyl ester resin i'm a big fan of their product i want a good thorough mix we don't want any ribbons we want to reverse the rotation Good deal. Now I'm going with this straight into an acetone bucket to let that soak 
because it can be a bit of a bear. We don't have a whole lot of time, but I'm going to simulate. If we were building a boat, we would try to tip it on its nose. And you will notice that foam is going to run forward. It is going to run forward a bit. Now, one thing you can do sometimes as bow builders, we don't want to jostle that around a lot either as it's expanding. Sometimes what we'll do is have a series of holes. These holes are large for a compartment this size, but generally around a two inch diameter is going to be the way to go. And sometimes we'll use a little pieces of wood block with some wax paper. You can use these spreader blades work quite well and as the foam expands you can plug the hole and kind of encourage it to move forward now typically when we pour foam in a boat especially smaller boats a lot of times we can actually lift the stern up and we're pouring towards the front it seems like if you can put a bigger volume in and fill that void or that cavity from the front back we should be starting to get some nice expansion there Typically takes somewhere around seven minutes or so. And you can see right here, maybe my cameraman can pan in. We are getting near. And as it gets close to the top, I'm actually gonna cap that. Put a brick on it to kind of simulate what we would do on a boat build. Here we come with Spot number two. And we're going to let some vent out, the forward ones. And that's going to put a little bit of weight on there too. Foam has a surprising amount of power as it's expanding. And a lot of times we will keep a stock of old batteries or bricks around. And if we're pouring foam in the floor of a boat, a lot of times we will preload that floor a little bit with some extra weight. Um, I tell people foam is like a explosion in slow motion and once it starts matter of fact you can see it pushing a bulge i don't know if you folks can the camera's catching that it's wanting to push that panel up a little bit normally what i would do i wanted to show you folks at home but normally what i would done is covered covered those at the last second we are pretty close on our calculations. I know a lot of folks, sometimes it can be confusing how much foam do you need, but if you can kind of remember, it expands at a rate of about 25 to 30 to one. Um, if you had, if you bought a two gallon kit, you got two gallons, so you're gonna be making a pretty considerable volume. Just multiply each gallon by looking at nearly 50 gallons of volume for a two gallon kit conservatively. All right, and even then you can see now this is just flimsy plastic and you did get some some push up there We got a little bit of push up on the edges Obviously a boat is going to be a lot tougher a lot more rigid But that's going to add considerable Strength if you've got a fairly thin hull. That's why a lot of manufacturers added as well as it does add considerable strength to a vessel and again, the Coast Guard requires it. So if you've got an older boat that's under 21 feet and you start thinking, well, I want to take the foam out of it, the builder could have put it there to add some strength and legally it's supposed to be there. So you would hate to remove it and you say, well, man, I'll make airtight chambers underneath, which is actually what we did when we built our 29. We did not put foam under the floor because I'm not required to, but we had a whole series of airtight chambers. But the problem is if, if you were to rupture a series of those chambers, water can still get in them. Whereas with a foam filled cavity, water can't get in there in the, in the event you have an emergency type situation. So you can see here, even with these vent holes in here, we've got some push up on this compartment there. Now there are other ways to do it. And when we start tackling our 21 foot project boat that if y'all go back several episodes, you can see we got a project boat's gonna need stringers, floor transom, foam flotation. Even when we used to build some 19 footers here in the shop, 
we would pour the foam in between the stringers and then trim it down flush and then actually encapsulate it in fiberglass. And I'm gonna show you folks at home when we get a little bit further along how we did that once we get into our test project, project boat. Okay, so you can see we even had a little bit there in the cup, just that tiny bit. And it does generate some warmth as well. Something to kind of be aware of. Now, something else to be aware of, just like almost all the chemicals we deal with when it comes to gel coat and resin and whatnot, temperature does affect the foam. The hotter it is, the faster, the more vigorously it's gonna rise. Um, the test the parameters they usually set it are like 77 degrees, which is kind of like your baseline for almost all materials. But this is a serious factor. If the humidity is very, very high or it's raining, that can be a problem for foam's expansion rate. So you want a fairly low humidity day. So we're going back. Now, once again, we're going to pour another, going to pour up another test batch there and see what happens. Let's go with, and y'all notice I put A, and A, mark these very clearly. Sometimes it's pretty easy to get them crisscrossed. Almost, nice and easy. It is important to be accurate. Believe I'm right there. And and you folks that have been following the channel know that my videos are not short and abbreviated and I don't do a lot of editing. I want you folks at home to get a real-time view of these materials and how they work. And I'm going to be talking all through the video explaining what's happening. There we go. That might just be a smidge over. But I think I went a smidge over on the other one as well. Right, we got everything. Let's see, we need our mixer, our trusty five gallon bucket. And it's amazing, you can kind of just slush that around a little bit. And you folks, again, boats under 21 are required to have foam by the Coast Guard. The foam can and does add strength. And yes, it can soak some water over time if it's not sealed or encapsulated properly. So just like about anything in life, there are pros and cons. There's our B part. The B is generally kind of a lighter honey color. The A tends to be darker in nature. Very good. There's other things you can do with the foam. There's other things you can do with the foam. A lot of people, you can use it for modeling or shaping. You can actually pour it into uh, shapes and you can actually shape it into things. Uh, anything from like a, a parade float to replicas of animals. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done with it. It's also very beneficial as a flotation material or an insulation material. Um, this is a two pound density foam, which means one cubic foot of it is gonna weigh about two pounds. There are other structural foams available. You do not wanna get this stuff on you either. It is no bueno. It is very, very sticky. But two pound as a reference for flotation foam, you want the lightest possible. You can see that is already trying to go. Sometimes making videos, talking and working. <laughs> All right, put the lid on there. A little bit of tilt to it. For structural foams, like for example, if you folks are new to the channel and haven't seen when we built our hard top for our 29 footer, we used a six pound 
6.6 pound density air x foam core is a structural foam core and then when we built the internal framing for our 29 in the background we used kusa board which is a 26 pound density polyurethane foam again i'm gonna put a little tilt on there to simulate if we were pouring it in a boat and i can tell you that larger batches you're going to get more efficiency but you got to be super careful because you can blow a floor out of a boat it can lift a panel good idea to have some weight on there but on this one for the sake of testing we're not gonna add any weight while we're waiting for this to rise, now's a good time to tell everyone thank you so much for subscribing, watching, giving the thumbs up, sharing our content. And uh, I know there's a lot of ways you can be spending our time and we genuinely appreciate you folks. And if you can think of any way to share the content we're making here with other boating or fishing communities, it'd be greatly appreciated. And any of the products that we're using can be purchased through our Amazon links below the video's description so all of the fiberglass foam gel coat even miscellaneous tools that we use are going to be available through our amazon links if you want to buy some of these same materials now sometimes if you over mix or over aerate which i may have had just a touch of that while i was talking you want to mix that foam till you get kind of an opacity to it and a, just a good uniform mix, but you don't want to over mix the foam or it can actually kind of knock it, knock it back down. And I think I got a little bit of that on this batch, but I also wanted to show how you can calculate the volume and, and get it close. You can see we've got some lifting and bulging going on there that's also generating some heat that is normal all right we're going to give that just a second more now one thing you can keep in mind we had another sample piece over here you can sand and shape this material pretty easily and get some unique shapes you can kind of sculpt or make things i mean kind of the sky's the limit there it's just neat stuff to work with but again its primary function is going to be flotation you can see now we're getting some some lift <laughs> always fascinated by this stuff when i was when i was a kid now we're gonna go one more time and I want to show you folks just what happens if you get just a pure runaway. Oh man, I tell you what, as you get older, the eyesight is just not. I'm going to go eight ounces this time. There we go. The more you deal with this stuff, the more comfortable you will be. Now, if you're just tuning into this video again and you're new to the channel, our previous video, we did a three video series of how to spray gel coat, which we got here with an inexpensive off the shelf $100 spray rig and get some pretty amazing results. We've got a test panel here that pretty proud of how that gel coat turned out by using a fairly inexpensive spray gun so let's go one more time and this time i'm going to go just with a paddle mix and show you folks what is going to happen if you don't have a drill now we did two identical volumes here, these two test pieces we did, and we got a slight, it was a very slight reduction in volume or yield 
mixing with a wood paddle versus mixing with a drill. So just remember that you're going to get more expansion. We had 158 ounces worth of expansion versus 153. So it wasn't a huge amount, but you want maximum expansion when you're doing these kind of products. That's going to give you the best yield. All right, now what we're going to do, we're just going to see what this thing does when it does a runaway or has a runaway. But in the meantime, check this out. We've got substantial lift, still got a little bit of a void right up in that corner. And that's one of the tricky things. If you put a floor down first and then drill holes, obviously you do not have clear containers and you can't see where you've missed. So sometimes you just have to drill prospect holes and fill in the voids. Whereas if you pour the material between the stringers and then trim it flush and then seal it with some resin, you know for a fact that you've gotten everything. Oh boy, there it goes. And this stuff is quite sticky, even these over here. You definitely want to wear some gloves. Pretty neat stuff. When I was a boy in the boat shop, my dad used some of this stuff and I was always fascinated by it. They look like these little mushrooms. A lot of times dad would pour it in compartments and there'd be these little bubbles sticking out. And uh, we had a lot of fun with them. I grew up the age before uh, video games and cable TV. So we spent a lot of time outside and found ways to entertain ourselves. Now you can again, sand this stuff. Be very careful. If you get it in your eyes, it is incredibly scratchy. You're going to want to wear like a full face respirator or a face shield or just be very careful. If you get any of this foam dust on your fingers, do not get it in your eyes. It's going to be itchy and scratchy underneath your clothes as well. And uh, just want to be cautious when dealing with it. And as it's in this state, it's going to be odd. If you touch it, it'll kind of, it'll, um, it's like us. Someone who was a baker told me that like when you, when a cake is rising, if you shake it or touch it or shift it, it can be a problem. And so once it starts to rise, you do not want to disturb it or else it'll impact the yield or the volume that you're going to get. So we'll leave these around the shop as a, as a test. Uh, <laughs> test panels to just kind of showcase who knows what we'll do with this in the future I may even demonstrate taking the lid and how I would shave the foam flush and seal it with some epoxy or some fiberglass and it does take a bit of time for this foam to really really harden up um, this these test batches are still fairly flexible but if you look at these we did those about an hour and a half two hours ago and they're quite quite hard, quite resilient there. So um, I hope you folks at home enjoyed this video and I want you guys to know how much I appreciate you watching. If you're enjoying the content, please remember to like, subscribe, comment, share, all that good stuff. It's Captain Joe here with Island Marine Charters, Fish Bump TV. My son is my amazing cameraman and we'll be sure to catch you folks on the next episode.